Welcome back, friends. You're listening to Parenting for the Culture on the Black Love Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Cherise Sims. Y'all, my heart is heavy today. It's heavy. And I don't even know how to start this podcast episode. I don't know how to welcome you because the world does not feel very welcoming right now. Today's the 144th day of 2022, and the shooting that just happened in Texas was the 212th mass shooting of 2022. That blows my mind. And a lot of us are, I don't know what a lot of us are. A lot of us probably feel a lot like me, where we just don't know exactly what we're feeling, but we feel it emotionally, mentally, physically. I feel this in my body. I feel it moving in my body and trembling in my hands and pounding in my chest and getting stuck in my throat. I feel it throughout my whole body. And I have no one word or no 10 words to describe how it feels or what this is. And there are lots of questions and lots of ideas and lots of shoulds. And I think that all of it needs to be listened to. And I think that we also need to give ourselves time to process all of it. One thing that's on my mind is different aspects of what I hear about this or surrounding this. I know that when I was growing up in school, we had earthquake drills, we had fire drills, and now we have active shooting drills. And that to me is insane. I mean, you have preparation for natural disaster and then just inhumane disaster. And these things that I'm hearing about the preparation, I've heard, you know, put textbooks in your backpack and put your backpack on your chest as a bulletproof vest. This is what's being taught in elementary school, that our five-year-olds are going into school, our six-year-olds, our seven-year-olds are going into school and having to learn how to take a bullet, how to survive a shooting. That should not be something that they have to worry about. That should not be something that they have to prep and practice for. I've heard that some of these drills require students to bang on doors and act like they're stuck outside so that students can practice leaving them outside the door. (laughs) That if they didn't make it into a classroom on time, that it was their job to keep themselves safe and find a bathroom and stand on top of the stalls to hide their feet so that the active shooter didn't know they're in the bathroom to try to keep themselves safe. To have to be in such a position and have to be alone and have to be a child. I don't know why so many people believe that hell is a place we go after we die if you're a bad person. To me, that sounds like hell on earth. And there's no reason that any child should have to experience that hell or any other hell that people are bringing about. And one thing that I don't understand about our culture is this idea of protection against prevention. Why are we putting time and effort and money into teaching our children how to prevent getting shooted rather than actually protecting them from these events? And I don't have the answers. And I wish I was more knowledgeable about all of the laws and the bills and even people being elected into office. I'm not. I'm not that person. Sometimes I think I'm purposely and intentionally not that person because it's overwhelming and it's exhausting and sometimes it feels hopeless. And I just like to hang out with the kids that are around me. (laughs) Just like to hang out with my kids and the kids in my classroom because they're so full of pure joy and laughter, and love, and creativity, and imagination, and care for one another. Like, children naturally care for one another. One thing that I loved about having a preschool was the group of children that I had, and this was every year. This It didn't matter which children it was. It didn't matter the year. Every single year, these group of children just surrounded each other and protected each other with love. If they were running on the playground 
and they're playing chase and they're on different teams or the same team, whatever it was, if somebody fell on the playground and skinned their knee, I promise you every single child would run over to them, huddle around them, help pick them up, ask them if they were okay, ask them if they needed anything. They would check on their knee. They would help them get to safety. They just naturally loved and protected one another. And to take that child and then teach them, (laughs) leave someone outside if they didn't make it in, I I just, no words. And I know a big question in this also has to do with, how do I talk to my child about this? What do I say to my child? And again, I have no good answers. I have no great answers. I don't believe that this is something that we were made to experience. I don't think that our bodies were created to experience these type of events. And because of that, I don't think that there is a right way or a good way or a best way to approach these situations. There's just intuition, love, grace, compassion, prayer, meditation. And when I say prayer, I don't mean just pray for them. Y'all, I'm Christian. I love God. I'm a minister in my church. I pray without ceasing. But even in the Christian faith, we say prayer without works is dead. We can no longer just pray for somebody. (laughs) We can no longer just pray for a child who's getting shot up and just pray for their families who dropped them off and didn't get to pick them up. We can no longer just pray We have to move. We have to do something. And I talk to myself first. And I know that the first thing I can do is educate myself. I can find out where I can vote, what I can sign, where I can march, who I can call, where I can write a letter, what group I can join, what Zoom can I attend to learn more, to learn where my voice can be heard, to learn what I can do. No more moments of silence in honor of. Let's get loud. We have to start getting loud. We have to do something because our children are dying. And so often we say our children are the future. No, our children are the present. They're a gift. They're right now. They're here full of the purest, greatest, most unique gifts ever. We have to protect them now. If you feel led to talk to your child, talk to your child If you feel the need to hold your child and cry with your child, hold your child and cry with your child. If you feel the need to take your child to the park and laugh and play and run and find joy in the day, do that. If your child comes to you and asks questions, answer them as honestly as you can. Sometimes these bigger issues that we have with children We question how to address it, and we make it so complicated. Answer in the simplest, most direct form. There was a shooter. He killed X amount of people. It is scary. I know it's scary. And check in with them. How does that make you feel? It's okay. If you're angry, that's okay. If you're sad, that's natural. If you're scared, I get that. I feel that way too. If you don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. Let's find out together. If your child is young and maybe they're not yet on social media, maybe they're not yet hearing about these things, they have younger classmates, this isn't being talked about. Maybe you're wondering, do I bring this up to my child or do I preserve their innocence? Do I wait? Do I let them think that the world is good and do I just wait before I introduce this? I think that's up to you. You know yourself best and you know your child best and your child was not given to you by accident. They were given to you because you are the perfect parent for that child and you know best what that child needs. But I will say that if your child ever has access to older children or the playground or anywhere where they might hear about what things are going on, ask yourself, where do I want my child to learn this first? Do I want my child to learn this with me first or do I want to wait for someone else to introduce it to them and then me answer the questions? And again, there is no right or wrong answer to that. 
It really is a preferential thing. I do know that for me, I want to be the one to bring it up with them. I want to address it with them because I've worked very hard to create safe spaces with my children. And I believe that I'm the safest space for them. And that's where I want them to learn those things, where they have the safety to break down and cry, where they have the safety to get mad, where they have the safety to ask all of their questions. And I also want to continue to build that trust with my children. I don't want my children to feel like, why didn't you tell me? Did you know about this? Why didn't you tell me? But if that were to happen, if I did know about it and I chose not to tell them and they asked me, again, I would be honest and direct. I held on to this information because I didn't know if you'd be able to manage it right now. It's really hard. And I'm still processing how it feels for me. And I wasn't ready to talk about it yet. I'm sorry you had to hear from it from somebody else. Do you have questions about it? That's kind of the best that I can give you. And I know the best isn't good. (laughs) And when it comes to our schools, I can't go into active school shooting drills. I don't know about them well. I don't remember when my children were in school. I don't remember being notified about active shooting drills. But I do know that their teachers that they used to have, I know that they practiced those this year. I don't know if this is new in California and things that they've been doing in other states. I don't know if they notify parents. I mean, it's crazy to me. But what I do know is that we, as parents, when we trust the schools and when we send our children to schools, we see these events happening in our world and we wonder, what is the school's responsibility? Is the school responsible for talking to my child about what's going on? And if they are, what are they going to say? Am I going to be prepared? I remember one day my, my daughter came home. She was 10 years old at the time. She was in fifth grade and she came home and she said, mom, what's your stance on abortion? And I was taken all the way back. I said, excuse me? She said, yeah, what's your stance on abortion? And I was like, what do you know about abortion? And I was so blindsided by the fact that my child was learning about abortion in school and learning about the laws. And I mean, it was great. Her teacher was amazing. She was learning so much information, but I just wasn't prepared. And she asked me in front of my, I think the youngest one was about three or two years old at the time. And so I certainly wasn't prepared to introduce all of the information surrounding that to the three-year-old. I share that story because it's important that we know what's going on in the schools. School and home should not be two completely separate things. There should be a home to school partnership and relationship. If your child is in a school, that should be their home away from home. You should know what's happening during the day. You should have access to know what their curriculum is. You should have access to know what the special lessons and assemblies and drills are. If they're having a fire drill, let me know. If you're having an active shooting drill, please let me know because my child's not coming that day. You're not about to tell my child that there's a shooter in the school and not let them know whether or not this is real. Well, I'm, I'm not doing that to my child. We're not going through that trauma. So please let me know so I can keep them home. And maybe that's why y'all don't tell the parents or don't tell them because you want them to experience it. I don't know. But there should be a strong communica- communication between the school and the home between the teachers and the parents, and that goes both ways. Parents, you hold a lot of power. And I don't know if parents really know the amount of power they have when it comes to their children's education, but you have a lot of power. If you want to see something in the classroom, talk to your teacher. If you want a book read in the classroom, talk to your child's teacher. If you want to find out if and how they're addressing these topics, talk to them. It would be ideal that the teachers are sending out emails or letters or class dojos or calling you. I've had one of my daughter's teachers, she called us a few days before school started. She took the time to call each and every parent and introduce herself and say, here's my cell phone number. If you need me at all during the year, here's how you can reach me. That was seven years ago. To this day, we bring her birthday cake on her birthday. We know her new puppy that she got. We love her. Her name is Miss Lopez. (laughs) I'm going to shout her out because she's amazing. 
but we love her. But that's how teachers should be. They should be developing that personal relationship with you. They're watching our children. They're spending seven to eight hours a day with our children. They should know us. They should know who we are. They should know what we do in the home. They should know what language we speak in the home. They should know if our grandparents live in the home with us or if we have a dog. They should know these things because they should care about our children and they should know our children. And if our children are learning things in school, we should know about it. We should know who they're friends with, what they're learning, what they did during the day. These are powerful and important things for you to know. So if these events are happening in our country and your school is not addressing it, address your school and ask them, how do you plan to address this? And that doesn't mean that you are requiring them to address it. You just want to know. These things are happening and I have to protect my child and I have to raise them and I have to teach them and I have to guide them and I need to know what's happening. How do I balance this at home? What are they learning in school? How do I support that at home? Or what do I need to cover at home because it's not happening in school? And how can I support? I'm sure this is hard for you too. Let me tell you on the other end, I'm a parent. I can talk about that side, but I'm also an educator. I can talk about that side. It's hard. We're managing 20 to 30 families at a time that all have different beliefs, desires, expectations, and where one parent might really, really want you to address something in the school, another parent is highly offended and mad that you're addressing it. And there has to be a balance there. And sometimes that takes time. Sometimes we can't do it overnight. Sometimes we need a weekend to plan it out and map it out. But again, communication is key. I can let you know as the teacher This happened. This is how I'm feeling. This is what I'm planning on doing. And then teachers should also be sharing resources. Here's a Zoom you can go to to learn about these laws, to learn about gun control. Here's a workshop that you can attend or a webinar that you can attend to learn about child's rights. Here's an article you can read that teaches you about active shooter training, safety, whatever it's called. Your teacher should be sharing resources. And if you're the type of parent that loves to Google and loves to find all your own articles and research and resources, share that with your teacher. Hey, I found a great book. Can you share this with the parents in the next newsletter? Hey, I found an amazing person who does workshops. That, hey, is probably towards the principal. But hey, principal, I found this amazing person that hosts these workshops. Do you think we can get them into the school? How do you think we can get them here? What do you need? How can I help? Yesterday, when I did find out about the shooting in Texas, it was an interesting experience because I heard about it. And of course, I said, oh, this makes me so sick to my stomach. I'm so tired of hearing this. This is so heartbreaking. I went through all the fear, the anger, the disgust. I felt all that. And I consider myself to be a very compassionate and empathetic person. And then I remembered that my best friend's just moved to Texas with my godchildren. And I remembered that my best friend just got a job teaching at a school in Texas, and I didn't know which school she taught at, and I didn't know which school they went to. And so I quickly got on my phone, and I called her, and she didn't answer the phone. And then I called her again, and she didn't answer the phone. And then I called her again, and I called her again, and I called her again, again. And by the 15th phone call, I'm simultaneously on my iPad sending her text messages. And I'm like, oh, do I call my God children? I don't want to call my God children because what if they're fine and they don't know about the shooter? And like, they're going to be like, why are you calling me in the middle of the day, God, mommy? So I'm like, I don't want to call them. I don't want to freak them out. I need to stay calm. Sharice, don't worry. You don't have to worry until there's something to worry about. So just stay calm. Don't cry. Don't freak out. And I'm telling myself not to freak out while I'm sending her text messages on every platform possible while dialing her and trying to FaceTime her every which way to try to just make sure that she answered the phone, right? But I'm still like, just don't cry until there's something to cry about. And then finally, I call her husband and her husband answers the phone and he says, hey, Sharice, what's up? And so I knew by the sound of his voice, I said, oh, he's okay. She's okay. They're all okay. And as soon as I heard his voice, I broke 
down. And you would think, I'm telling myself, don't cry until you know there's something to cry about. But I broke down just hearing them because my body caught up with itself. And I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't stop shaking. I'm snot crying. Like, I'm devastated. And my friends are okay. And they're here. But it taught me a few things. I'm like, oh, I thought I'm a compassionate, empathetic person. But this hits different when you're personally connected. And I hear so many people talking about how often this is happening and that we're becoming numb to it. And I thought to myself, no, not me. I'm not numb to it. This is still making me sick. But it was different when I thought that this might be my best friends and this might be my godchildren. And I'm, I'm still feeling that today. Like the feeling of losing someone and several people that I love so deeply I feel it today. And they're here. They're here and they're okay. But my body has not caught up with what's happening. And part of why I share that too is because when we have our children, so often we expect them to move in and out of different emotions very quickly, not realizing that some of these emotions are really physical, biological, chemical emotions, feelings, hormones that we cannot just instantly change because logic says you shouldn't feel that way right? My friends are okay, but I'm still devastated. And of course, there's that added layer of this tragedy that still happened. But one of the questions I ask, and maybe that's our homework for this week, is like, how do we stop ourselves from getting numb? How do we feel connected enough that we all feel like we have lost? And not just in the way where we're like, oh, this is sickening. That's easy, Saying, oh, this is sickening, this is disgusting, it's heartbreaking. That's the type of thing that has us hashtag for a week and then move on. How do we all feel like we have lost those children? And I'm not saying that I want us all to be traumatized and I want us all to be devastated, but I want us all to move. I want us all to act. I want us all to demand change and protection and prevention. (laughs) And this is the last, last, last thing that I'll share. Is that one of the things when we are raising our children in those first five years, we always know that these first five years are so important. And we have that question, do I tell them or do I just preserve their innocence? Again, no right or wrong answer. But those first five years are the formative years where your child develops a sense of, is this world good Or is this world bad? Are people good or are people bad? And the rest of their life, it's either supporting or challenging that idea, right? We we, we get that foundation. That doesn't mean that it's going to stay with us always. We do the best that we can to give them a solid foundation. But there are variables and there is the world and they have their own experiences. So the rest of those years after the first five are, were you right in your foundation? Is it true that the world is good good or bad or is it false that the world is good or bad? So when I think about these things and I think about do I talk to my child or not? Do I bring this up to them or not? Do I preserve their innocence or not? I have to kind of stop and ask myself too, you know, what are your beliefs about this world? Do you believe that the world is good or do you believe that the world is bad? Do you believe that people are good or do you believe people are bad? And what belief do I want to pass down to my children? Ultimately, I want my children to believe that the world is good. I want them to believe that people are good. I want them to be aware that there is hate in the world and ugliness in the world because I do want them to be, I don't even know how to finish that sentence. I feel like every finish to that sentence is is what I want to move away from. I don't want my children to be prepared for hate, right? I don't want my children to be, I don't want there to be hate, (laughs) but I don't want my children to be blindsided. And being aware that there is a problem allows you to fix a problem, right? But if you believe that the world is good, then you have an image and a foundation of something to work towards when things are bad. And I think that's what I want for my children. I want my children to believe that the world is good, know that there is bad in this world, but have a foundation where they believe that the world can be better so that they have hope to make the world better so that they can hold on to their creativity and their love and their compassion to create a better world. 
to create a more just world, a more fair world. I want them to believe that they're valuable, that the people around them are valuable, so that they can create a place that values people, regardless of their age, that values them. And so with that thought, I just want to remind you that even with the bad things that are happening, make sure that you remind your children about good things, right? And it's hard. It's, it's so nuanced and it's, I have so many thoughts and feelings. It's hard for me to articulate what I'm even thinking because it's not like, mom, I don't want to go to school. School is scary. There are shooters. Oh, yeah, but babe, what about all the good days you had at school? I'm not saying do that. <laughs> like take time go through the feelings, go through the motions, but also remember the good things about the world. It's easy to spread bad news. It's easy to hold on to bad news. I don't have the science, but I believe that there's some science about our bodies will hold on to bad news easier than it will good news or positive news. So just make sure that you're pointing out the good things or being the good thing in their life, right? My children always make fun of me. They say, Mom, every time you pass a black woman, you tell her how beautiful she is. Good. <laughs> you can make fun of me all you want, but I love that that's what you see. Let, let, let you see somebody that compliments someone all of the time. Oh, mom, you think everything is exciting. I do. Life is exciting. So much to be excited about. It's like be the good in their world. Do something good for people. I remember um, someone once told me, I hate when people just say, hi, how are you? Because they don't really mean it. They don't really want to know how you are. And her mind changed when we went through a Starbucks and I asked the woman giving me my Starbucks, I said, how are you? She said, oh, you know, I'm actually having a bad day. And I said, I'm sorry. And then we left the Starbucks and I went and got the Starbucks barista some roses and I brought them back to her. And the girl was like, this is my friend. I don't know why I'm calling her the girl. (laughs) My friend, Leah. She's like, wow, I've never... I've never experienced that. Someone actually asking, how are you? Because they actually genuinely care how you are. So, I mean, these are the small things we can do. When you ask someone, how are you? Don't just let that be a passing phrase when you walk by someone. Actually stop and listen to their answer. Find out how people are doing and then do something about it. But be someone who is good, who brings good, who shows your child that while there is bad in the world. And we all know that bad is not even a word to suffice what's happening right now. But while there is so much ugly and hate in the world, there is also good in the world. And then be that good in the world so that your children can be that good in the world. That really is all that I have for you guys today. I love you guys. You are beautiful. You are kind. You are strong. You are able And if you are weak, that's okay. You can be weak for a moment and then find your strength in community and let's build together. Parenting for the Culture is executive produced by Cody and Tommy Oliver. Our senior producer is Crystal Hill. Art is by Koi Madison. Parenting for the Culture is a Black Love Podcast Network production. (laughs) 